what's your tolerance for, for failure? I mean, yes, it's mindset, but how much of it is a uh, mental illness? As far as like the obsessive nature of not wanting to fail, I mean, let's call it stubbornness in general. There has to be some amount of stubbornness um, to force you to keep getting back up. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Honey Stinger, made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Use the code SPARTANATHLETE30 at HoneyStinger.com for 30% off to help you sweeten the burn. Joe DeSena, CEO and founder of Spartan and the Spartan Up podcast. I've got Alex Kopach on. He is an Olympic gold medalist, downhill. It's got to be downhill if it's a bobsledder, right? You, can't, you don't bobsled uphill. That's and, right. <laughs> and, and you're a newly minted entrepreneur. Congratulations. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on, Joe. What, um, what can we learn from bobsledding? There's a lot of people out there that watch bobsledding, and they're like, that doesn't look that hard. I mean, you just jump in the damn sled, and it takes you to the bottom. Is that true? Yeah, it's funny. I was um, with with some of the school talks I've been doing the last week and a half. I was putting on. Uh, I don't know if you remember 2010. The Americans won a gold medal in bobsled. It was Stephen Holcomb and his crew, mm-hmm. and uh, some of the comments in the in, in the section because it's a YouTube link. A lot of people are like, "How is this a sport? What are they doing?" Blah 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 blah. And then some people's rebuttals are like, "Did you see the size of their legs and all that?" And so when I try to explain to to, to students or, or, or other people about bobsled is like such a weird mix of like like Formula One. We like we're the pit crew. We're also trying to make sure we're, we're trying to tweak it just to, to you know improve some kind of like dynamics as we're going down. And on top of it, we have to be maximum power, right? And so kind of going back to the Formula One analogy, it's like how much power can we distribute to the wheels? Well, we are that piece. And so um, we fight tooth and nail just to get a hundredth of a second faster uh, all year. It's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but uh, it's cool when you see some of the athletes are in the sport. I mean, you have guys that have like 65 inch verts that are lifting like 180 kilos in their cleans. They're squatting over 550 kilos. They're sprinting, uh, you know, sub 1100 meters and they're weighing at about 240 pounds. I mean, like it's, it doesn't get more athletic than that. That is, um, that is incredible. And, and how much training, like, does somebody start bobsledding at a very young age or is it, or is it, you come from the NFL and you, you jump over to bobsledding? How does that work? Yeah, usually it's, uh, it definitely is, is more of a, a fan of transition uh, athletes. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, uh, depending on the country, um, I'd say North America, it wouldn't be like a, a forefront sport for people to jump into. Um, but the second piece is, uh, because it requires such strength and speed, um, you want to have the athlete to be like developed. And I don't just mean like from hormonal and all that, but like usually you start hitting your physical peak between like 26 to 36. And, um, I'm not sure if that still rings true, but, but the average age of most bobsledders when they're, when they're winning and doing a ton is, is generally around like between 28 and 32. Um, and, and I think it has a lot to do with that foundation, that strength and speed foundation. How long were you doing it? How many years were you uh, in it? I mean, where and where'd you build your foundation? Prior to getting into bobsled, I ended up doing just about four and a half years, almost five. Um, I was a shop owner for, for, for a couple of years in undergrad. Um, and prior to that, I did a lot of football. I did all sorts of sports. And so when I, when I encourage young people to say, like, just do a ton of things, learn how your body moves, get your center of balance sorted out. Because then at that point, you know, putting on size and strength is a, little, a lot easier, but figuring out new movements, that's, that's, the, that's the hardest piece about, about anything when you're looking at a new skill. So um, having a big power base from throwing was very helpful. Um, and I also didn't know how much natural speed I had. And so once I started to learn how to sprint properly, it was like, it was like obvious that even though I was still able to, to keep on like 260 pounds, I could run really fast. Um, and then you kind of dance on that edge between such a big power output. Can your materials hold up? So tendons, joints, stuff like that. That's where it starts to give because the muscles are so explosive. What a great sentence. Can the materials hold up the connective tissue? What, what do you think is the trick there? Like how, how do you get your foundation and that structure rock solid? Is it all that, that work in shot putting or, or the pre bobsled work? So, so I'd say, okay, let's say perfect world right? You would have like a really nice, uh, increase in like work capacity from like, let's say 16 or maybe 18 to 28. And if you can have like a nice ramping up, 
um, it gives time to get the tendons to get stronger because because there's such a re reduction in capillarization there. It takes so much more to lay good collagen fibers down um, and to allow like those those connective points between the tendon to the to the bone to to also get comfortable with those loads. Um, you know, in my case, it was zero to hundred real fast. Um, I pushed myself harder than, than most, I think, um, had a very brutal training schedule. Um, I mean, all of it was like the goal was, was clear, right. To not just, um, be the best in my country, be the best in the world. Um, but there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of prices to be paid. Now I'd say, you know, high risk, high reward, whether it's, uh, investments or otherwise, but if you have the opportunity to do a little bit more of a, a nice progression, your body will thank you. I think yoga. Yeah. I mean, now, now I'm, I'm trying to put myself back together. <laughs> a lot of damage, a lot of damage gets done in, in bobsledding. I mean, if you don't crash, is it, um, is it putting that kind of stress on the body? Totally. I, I think, I mean, we're, we're bent over usually, or like, like in really awkward, like rounded back positions. Um, and we can experience anywhere from like five to, to, to 10 G's, um, in an instant. And so that's quite a lot of like, you know, that, that compressive feeling. Um, a lot of us, if there's little like bumps in the track, we'll describe it like someone's hitting you over the back with a baseball bat. It's not, it's not that great. And then obviously like the, the positions as to where you attack the sled, uh, can be, uh, very aggressive on the low back. So like the taller you are, um, the more risk you have low back injuries in the sport. And then of course, like there's neck issues, um, because we're constantly trying to like resist the constant shake and vibration. Um, so, so unfortunately there's many ways to fail, but same with football, same with, with any kind of sport that has, that has some contact components. Like you could fail in any number of way. You know, it's funny as I sit here and think about some, some of the answers uh, to my questions, there, there are other countries that have spent their whole life bobsledding. You come in late in the game and then you steal the gold. Like, how does that feel if you're some other country that literally at six years old started sledding? Yeah, well, you feel like a bandit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, it's a perfect marriage of things. You know, I was with a pilot that had driven enough that he was in good shape. We had a, a new head coach that was also really good, brought some good ideas. We had an excellent mechanic. Um, you know, there's a big technology piece, right? Where if you have like the right tools, um, you know, all, all of it has to really line up and then it comes down to who makes the least amount of mistakes. I mean, that's one of the things that I try to like push, uh, to the young athletes where it's, uh, you know, at the Olympics, everyone's good. Everyone's ready to win. It's who's making the least amount of mistakes and th therein lies the preparation. What, um, let's talk about preparation. Is it like a million little things every day leading up to something like the Olympics or business or whatever it may be. Like th this is obviously something I'm really passionate about. And I try to instill in my own children's heads and everybody around me would be entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like, but what's your feeling? Is it a million little things, those details? But the underlying piece, and I'm sure you'd agree with this is, uh, is the direction clear? And if the direction's clear, doing those million little things become a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So the, the why piece, um, I feel like a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, some people jump into it because they think it's a cool idea, um, but they don't actually have um, a deep enough why to have a follow through for the long term. I mean, you've done a lot of gnarly things uh, to stay fit and to engage people to be fit. Um, you know, what is the purpose for you to do that? Well, you have a pretty big vision that you've explained in, in a lot of your podcast talks and, and videos and stuff. And, and that's probably what makes it easier to go through all those little things. And when a person's missing that, then you lose the million little, little details that set you up for really long-term success. Um, but then of course it goes without saying having good mentorship, uh, coaching, uh, that's everything. If I didn't have my coach Olaf Hampel, I wouldn't have become the champion I am today. I mean, I had a lot of the foundations with my mindset, but I didn't have the, the direction. So, so you get in the car, right? Let's use the car analogy. You get in the car mm -hmm. and you type in the address, right? In this new world uh, you probably don't remember you're too young, but years ago, you'd actually have to buy a paper map. Uh, even <laughs> before that, you probably had to create a map <laughs> because there were no maps right. right now. You, but now you just type in the address and that's your why, right? That's, that's the directions as you, as you would say. And then, um, you've got to have great mechanics, the coach, right? L like you said, um, you got to be all in. And then like, are you, um, spending, I went into, I went into another, um, Olympic level athletes house recently and there were, there were slash marks on the wall. And I said, what are those? I asked the dad, the dad was his coach. He said, that's 10,000 hours. We've spent 10,000 hours in this garage, but we didn't want to, 
We, w- we weren't ready for the big day until we knew we had our 10,000 hours covered. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book. Everybody read it. And 10,000 hours seems to be, you know, the standard for, for getting ready. Those are those little things you and I were talking about. So you got the direction. You got the great coach. You, you, you got to go crazy m- measuring and managing all those details for 10,000 hours. And then, and then what? And then I guess it's, it's mindset because everybody else up on that platform when you started, I'm thinking and asking at the same time, you probably all did that. I'll answer kind of this way. Um, conceptually, it's what's your tolerance for, for failure? Um, and I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, yes, it's mindset, but how much of it is a uh, mental illness? <laughs> I can fixate on some pretty crazy things and be really hard on myself, uh, which kind of has its own kind of negative consequence down the road. But, but as far as like the obsessive nature of not wanting to fail, um, I mean, let's call it stubbornness in general. There has to be some amount of stubbornness um, to force you to keep getting back up. Um, and to, for example, some, some athletes might say, you know, it's just one training day. It's not going to make or break anything. And, and you know, maybe that is actually a healthy thing to do for your body. But my mindset was I'm not missing any training days. Um, and if that means I've got to drive to another country, I'll do that to find a gym or find some way to, to get that, that done. So there was a, a lot of uncompromising uh, elements. Um, and so like, how does a person start that foundation of that mindset? Are you born with that? Can you build it? Um, and I'm, I'm so far, I mean, of course there's, there's a lot of room for discussion, but I, I, th- I think I'm pretty convinced that it's, it's having a very clear destination and having, uh, the right people around you to help, you know, to, to help push you through and keep you on that, on that trajectory. But, uh, how much of that self-motivation is there? I think, um, I think it's a mix, just like a, a good athlete has good genes sometimes, right? I mean, like there has to be a piece to that. And I think there's a lot that a person can learn to develop good habits, um, but, uh, I found for myself, it was just like a low tolerance for, for failure. Yeah. I'm thinking as you talk, I'm thinking, I was thinking about 5 AM this morning. Um, we have two boys and two girls. Um, our, our children go between nine years old and, and, and 16 and the girls play soccer and the boys wrestle. My wife was a very high level soccer player. And at 5 AM I was getting ready for my workout and I was asking her some questions. She was annoyed. Like, why was I asking questions at 5 AM? But I was asking how the tryouts went for the girls last night in soccer. And, you know, one thing I notice is, is she's not pushing the girls. Now, granted, she was very high level at soccer. You're very high level in, in your sports and clearly very high level in bobsled. Um, why wouldn't you push our girls? Why wouldn't you push them? to have a low tolerance for failure? Why wouldn't you practice, you know, those 10,000 hours? And her response at 5 a.m. this morning was, well, when I did it, Joe, I was just self, like, I just got up early in the morning. I kicked the ball a thousand times against the garage door till the garage door broke. And she's expecting our girls to do it. But maybe in some, maybe in some cases, you've got to kind of usher them along until they, until they do it, until it sticks. There, what do you think about that? We'll be right back to this interview, but first a little bit from today's sponsor, Honey Stinger. They have a special deal for Spartan Up listeners. Use the code SPARTANATHLETE30 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30%. Honey Stinger's waffles, energy chews, gels, and bars provide the fuel you need to push harder and go farther. For training and for racing, convenient nutrition that tastes great and works. Honey Stinger is Spartan's official on-course nutrition because it's made with delicious honey and organic ingredients. Honey is an excellent refueling source. Entering your bloodstream quickly, restoring depleted glycogen levels. Spartan's official on-course nutrition will elevate your performance for training and race day with honey-focused products. So go to HoneyStinger.com and use that code SPARTANATHLETE30 to save 30% off your organic waffles, chews, gels, bars, and hydration. All right, back to the interview. To do it, but maybe in some, maybe in some cases you've got to kind of usher them along until they until they do it, until it sticks there. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a lot to be said about, I mean, of course, like, like all things, uh, people say the answer's in the middle. Um, but a lot of these athletes that had reached really incredible heights, um, they were like insanely self-motivated. Um, but you know, perhaps where you try to usher the kids along is, I mean, of course there's good habits that'll pay off no matter what, 
right? So uh, the regular getting up early and doing something with your day and stuff like that, that's, that's very healthy for school and work or whatever they choose to do. Um, but maybe then the, the, the where you meet the the self wonder and self curiosity of the child to find that self motivation is through exposure of many sports. And then that one sticks where they are all of a sudden, like they can't stop thinking about it. And the next thing you know, they're getting up at four o'clock and you're like waking up at five being like, who's smashing balls against the side of the garage. You know, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing. Um, and, and you can see it across, uh, I mean, just chatting with teachers, um, let's say the right thing at the right moment. They didn't know someone was paying attention. All of a sudden the kids changed their trajectory completely. Um, so I guess what would be really cool is how does a person accelerate finding someone's, I don't want to say passion, like not in like a flighty way, but like something that really gives them that deep meaning that gives them that, that self impetus to go like, I want to do this to the best about my abilities. What do I need? And anything that you tell them that is a, is a tip, these absorb it immediately and then boom, they're ready to go. Like it's, and, and I'm sure you've seen it from uh, mentoring and who knows how many people have tried to like learn from you from a business capacity and any, anything that you say, they're like, that's Bible. We're doing it. I, I, I would think, look, there's 8 million people in New York city. When I lived in New York city, I would get up early in the morning. Like I always do and go for a run and of the 8 million people, maybe there were eight people in Central Park. Those were the self-motivated maniacs that didn't have late night jobs. And like, so my point is there's not a lot of people that have that self-motivation. And I would imagine when you find the place where that person's got incredible motivation, they know uh, where they're going to your point, right? They know the purpose. Um, they've got some great genetics, They've got some great coaches, parents. Like, that's when it all comes together, and, and, and you got a gold medalist. Um, in most cases, just my opinion, in most cases, you've got to hold that person's hand along the way. You've got to motivate them. You've got to do the best you can, and hopefully they find the thing that motivates them. But not everybody's going to be motivated like you, you are or I am or that person in the garage with 10,000 hours, Mark. Like, there's just not that many people like, and that doesn't mean everybody listening should say, oh, I'm not one of those people. Like, no, you, you, just might, you just might need a little more push behind you. That's all. And, and the acceptance of that is, is, is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Because I mentioned like there's, there's, there's times where I'm sure you've been in situations where because of how like go, go, go you can be, it can be detrimental. Because it's not like an infinite gift, you know. There's there's times where there's this ebb and flow, and um, and I think it's really cool to try and surround yourself with people that have uh, have balance. So maybe to the people that are trying to get more up and at them, surround themselves with a couple of people that are more your style, and then they can have those days where they can have that more of that push, and maybe eventually absorb some of those habits. Because at the end of the day, um, ten thousand hour principle or, or otherwise, it's about mindful practice. Are you doing it deliberately or are you just going through the motions? Um, and another thing, you know, from sporting, practice makes permanent. And so, again, with the 10,000 hours, if you practice poorly, well, you've got 10,000 hours of a bad habit. So, uh, you know, I think it's really great to set up good good habits. And, and that's and that's challenging. But then again, with, with a nice why, roadmap, and good people around you, I think really it's really possible to boost your life, whether it's sport or otherwise. Now, now, not everybody has access, you know, to the best coaching, or they don't even know what the best coaching looks like. How do you, how do you tackle that? How did you tackle that? Well, uh, I mean, using that car analogy, I knew I needed everything tuned to to a maximum. So, um, and something that maybe not comes naturally to everybody, but it's it's understanding like what does all in mean? Um, how much risk are you willing to tolerate? Uh, in my case, I ended up moving to a new country. I moved to Germany. I had to learn the language really fast. Um, the coach that I ended up uh, putting all my chips on um, turned out was a two-time gold medalist. I didn't know that at the time. Um, and we trained twice a day, uh, six days a week at a military base in the Alps. Um, you know, no Wi-Fi, military, you know, just on a bunk in a barrack kind of thing. Um, and I spent money I didn't have. And, uh, you know, all of that was with the understanding that this was going to be the best thing for me. So I guess the only thing that was lucky in that uh, setup is that he ended up being truly the best uh, teacher I could have found. Um, but it's getting comfortable taking that aggressive of a, of a move. Because had I not made that aggressive of a move, it might have been in eight years I had a chance to do a gold medal as opposed to four. But, uh, but of course, it could have also been a complete disaster. So... <laughs> No, I, I, I think that's a bold move that might, 
you know, a lot of people probably just accept where they are and the coaching they have, and that's that's all they can get. But um, but again, it's that it's that it's when when it all comes when all the stars come together, and that person has a desire, the the inability to lose. They just can't accept losses, right? They've got some genetics what you had, and then you're like, go out and find the coach you need, right? Yeah. It's like it's like in the movies when you. You, you see the boxer, you see the boxer show up at the door, right? And try to convince the coach. And the coach is like, what are you doing here? Yeah, you earn each other's respect. And, and I, I'd say to, um, <clears throat> to people that are, that are surprised at how some people have these big wins all the time, it's, they have to realize that they're taking big risks. And, and that's the thing. You have to dare to do something greater. Uh, and, and I think that's what really, like, really locks your why in. Like, how daring is your goal? I mean, it's got to be big enough that, that it makes you want to take pretty drastic changes to achieve it. Um, but then how do, you, how do you help set that goal for somebody? And then that goes back to surrounding yourself with people that maybe have done that. That can kind of help you ease your way into some of those bigger and bigger goals. Because that's when you're seeing people that have big changes. They maybe had a bunch of losses that you didn't see. But then one of their investments really took off. And then, boom, you know, they're, they're way ahead of where they were before, physically or otherwise. I love it. Tell me about your business. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, uh, um, it's a uh, medical devices. Uh, so I guess kind of like try to marry some of uh, my experiences in, in the last 10 year cycle. Uh, I had a friend of mine in the, in uh, the Netherlands kind of explained that to me there. We, we live in these 10 year cycles. So, um, I try to touch pace on my like engineering and physics, uh, undergrad background, and then something that was sport relative and then something that I was passionate about and that's, you know, medicine and, and, and helping people stay healthy. So, uh, we're trying to do things with a new idea of like proprioceptive insoles to try and keep muscle activity up but giving just enough of that kind of classic support that's necessary and then kind of pushing the tech on that. So going towards 3D printing um, and, and some of the research projects that we have lined up for that. And then once we have that uh, foundation firm, I want to do medical devices of all sorts. All right, before we wrap up, like an Olympic athlete trades in the bobsled for a chair and a computer. How are you going to integrate fitness? before you, You're going to go crazy if you're not staying fit. So... How are you incorporating it into your life? Because entrepreneurs tell me all the time they have no time. Yeah, I, um, I mean, since there was so much to learn, there were there were days where I, I did feel like there was no time, and then as you kind of get used to that, you start to kind of see like where you're where you can actually get more efficient. Um, I actually require some kind of endurance in the morning, um, and I don't know if that's just an athlete thing or if it's an ADHD thing, but I had been recommended to by another athlete that had done a transition, and he said strength training is not going to cut it. He's like, what chills me out the most and gives me a lot of kind of like forward momentum in the days is some kind of endurance in the morning. Um, and to remove my own excuses from not exercising, um, I created, I mean, again, like pandemic kind of kind of forced people to get creative. I have a, I have a gym set up downstairs. So I've got like a lot of the Olympic weights and stuff like that um, because, you know, maybe I won't have time during the day, but I could hit a good workout in before bed. Uh, and then that kind of saves me on the travel time. So um, that's been, that's been stuff I've been trying to do because not having that Olympic goal anymore, as far as like for fitness, uh, it was a job, you know what I mean? I was training all the time because I had to, uh, it was, it was an interesting challenge getting back to the wanting to phase. Um, all right. So no excuses, babe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know someone who needs a little help staying motivated, staying informed, getting or staying mentally and physically resilient? We're here three days every week with a mix of content to help you stay strong. From mindset to nutrition and everything in between. Listen every Tuesday to hear Joe DeSena, Spartan Race founder and CEO. And the rest of the week, join us for DECA, Endurance, and Classic episodes. See you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Honey Stinger, made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Use the code SPARTANATHLETE30 at HoneyStinger.com for 30% off to help you sweeten the burn.